Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of Library 2.013. This is kind of a sad, happy occasion. It's so delightful to have Dr. Jocelyn Cranefield here. Sad to think the conference will be over in an hour. Thank you so much for being here, Jocelyn. And we lost your mic if you were saying something, but. Hello. Um, thank you, Steve. And thank you to everyone who's here. I know that some of you have lasted quite a distance um, to get to this final keynote. So uh, thank you. And thank you also to those who are coming in later. My name is Jocelyn Cranfield, and um, I'm based uh, at Victoria University in Wellington in New Zealand. Um, I'm just going to show you this now. So I'm glad to take this part over, Jocelyn. Quickly, Good. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, yeah. thanks to our sponsors and supporters. So appreciative of San Jose State University, Follett, Blackboard Collaborate, EdWeb, and all of our great partners. This is a chance for those of you in the room to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. Click on it twice and click on the map, of course. We have folks in New Zealand, Australia, North America, the fun of these events is just seeing people from all over the world connect in such positive ways. Okay, please feel free to keep indicating in the chat where you're participating from. But and now, Dr. Greenfield, the time is yours. Thank you, Steve. Um, kia ora from New Zealand, and welcome to all of you. Uh, and again, thank you to those who are here now and those who are coming back to look at the recording. Um, so as Steve said, I, I work at Victoria University in New Zealand. Um, I'm a senior lecturer there, and I work in the area of information systems, which is really all about people, information technology, and organizations. Um, my colleagues here run a national master's program in information studies. Uh, and so we do see a, a lot of uh, people in the library area. And I'm sure that we've got, we possibly have some of our graduates listening today. Um, I'd also like to thank Sandy, Professor Sandy Hirsch, for inviting me to speak to you today. So anyway, well, now that you've had a few seconds to look at this, this picture, um, you can probably tell that it's an inverted map of the world. And here's New Zealand, OK? So we're right at the top, or at least that's how we like to think of it. Um, we're actually ranked 15th um, in the top 15 on the World Happiness Index. So in fact, it's not just wishful thinking. But I've actually started off with this map, not just because it shows New Zealand at the top, or nearly at the top, <laughs> um, but because this image is linking with a theme that is um, going to come up in my talk, which is information blindness and how we often fail to recognize information that, that maybe is right in front of us and it's really relevant to us just because we're looking at things in a different way. Um, so we, maybe we don't see information that, that's relevant to us and it can just sometimes distort our understanding. So why does this area of study interest me? Um, well, in fact, I'm a relatively recent uh, academic. And before coming to the university, I, I did a number of different things. I worked as a television director and floor manager. Um, I developed museum exhibitions and I even worked as an education publisher, and something I must mention for you people is that I once had the, the enviable title of Clark grade two in a, in a library, a government library. So um, what, what do these things have, all have in common? Um, I think that the common thread has really been that these jobs have been, for me, about connecting up ideas and knowledge with, with different groups of people and helping to make that knowledge more relevant to them. So I, I'm sure that's familiar to, to many of you. That's what many of you do in your day-to-day -day jobs as well. And in my case, it's also influenced what I see as being uh, relevant for research. 
uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this is, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my experience studying online communities and investigating how knowledge is transferred in online settings. Um, at this stage, I'd just like to make a distinction between knowledge that's, that's simply shared online and, and knowledge that makes a difference. So um, something that actually has some impact. And that's a question that I've been really interested in in my research. So how do, do new ideas contribute to change? Particularly, what is the online aspect of that? And what, what role do people play in that? So the key theme that I will start with and come back to it's, is around information blindness. So how, how this actually arises from human nature, and, um, but it's, I'm going to argue that it's actually being made, made worse today by uh, some, some technology aspects and, and particularly by some of the algorithms that we see when we're searching for information. And because this is a problem, we often rely on online communities. So hence their importance. And I'm going to talk about how we need to see online communities a bit more clearly and how we need to see the roles that people play in those communities more clearly because they can impact tremendously on knowledge transfer. Right. I, I'm wondering if anyone can, can guess what we're looking at here. If we have anyone. Let's see. Any cases, rocks. It's a desert. Okay, we're getting some Mars. <laughs> Very good. We're getting some good answers here, but uh, no one's. Yeah, okay. Peggy and um, Peggy and who else said uh, Bakri? You are right. It's it's a it's a desert. It's actually the a desert in the south of Peru, and it's called the the Naxa Desert. And in fact, um, so it's a kind of fairly stark um, landscape to look at. And when we look at it, we can't see anything particularly human here. But in the 1940s, a, um, an historian from Long Island University called Paul Kozak was actually flying over this desert because he was studying the ancient irrigation channels that were made here between 400 and 650 AD. And he flew over and this, he got a bit of a surprise. Because, you know, as you can see, having a bird's eye view gives us a totally different perspective. And in this case, we're looking at gaps between the rocks and it becomes quite stunning artwork. So, it's not just our perspective that uh, makes a difference to how we see things. And I'm sure a number of you will be pretty familiar with this. Um, this experiment is a famous experiment, and it's a basically it's a, a video showing a group of people passing around a basketball, and half of them have got black shirts on, and half of them have got white shirts on, and the viewer is asked to count the passes between the people who are wearing white shirt, white t-shirts. So they've got to focus on those white t-shirts and count the passes. Now I'm going to I'm going to have to ruin the experiment for those of you who haven't seen it before. Because this is what happens. And, and it turns out that about half of all the people who watch this experiment, who watch this video, don't even notice that someone dressed as a gorilla comes in and walks right through the shot and, and starts beating their chest. Now, how can something that's that incongruous actually escape from our attention? Well, it's, it's actually because we see mainly what we look for, as Sir John Lubick said a long time ago. Our attention, the way that we actually look for something, acts as a really powerful filter to, to other information. And even if that information seems quite blatantly obvious to us. Now here's another example. This is also, what we, what we see depends enormously on our, our prior interests, things that we already know and understand. And, and this is a fascinating book um, published this year by Alexandra Horowitz. And uh, in it, she describes walking around her city block in, in Manhattan with 11 different experts. She does 11 walks with 11 different experts. And she goes with an illustrator, a wildlife researcher, a sound designer, an engineer, I think, and eventually her son and, and her dog. Um, and of course, she sees entirely different things around her neighborhood with each one of those people. And it, that's because 
different people's perceptions can be so vastly different. And it turns out actually that's part of our normal human nature. We actually, as we, as we develop as humans, we, we learn to notice less and we need to do that. It's, it's a survival mechanism. So, so we have all these things kind of working against us that are part of our human nature. You could say that they're kind of part of our, our natural software. And what's really interesting is that the software that we write and the, the software that, that you're using every day is kind of making the situation even worse. So have, you've probably noticed that when you, when you search on something uh, today, if you're looking in Google, it actually predicts what you're going to ask. Now, now this is a really powerful tool and I'm sure that it's quite helpful, but the reality is that, that what we see um, is actually now being guided and, and suggested by algorithms. And when we do get the search results page, this is actually what often happens. It's often the only very first answer that gets noticed, 50% of clicks on the first answer. And the vast majority of people never even bother to go to the page two. So this is, this is really blindness by algorithm. And of course we, we could turn off our search history, but most of us just never bother to do that. And the result of that is that what we see in the search results and our news feeds depends on what we've already looked at. So not just what, we've, what we look for, but what we've looked at previously. So in fact we're becoming blinder because it's more convenient and that's, that's a scary thing. And here's another problem, the, um, what the algorithms actually see of us based on our profiles and our activity in Facebook or Google or Twitter or, or LinkedIn doesn't accurately reflect what we need to see and especially, you know, especially if it's the wrong um, thing that we're looking for. If we ask a human, we, we might get told we're looking for the wrong thing, but I bet you never see that on a Google search page. So you, you may well agree, um, but you may disagree, I don't know, that um, with Eli Pereza, who wrote The Filter Bubble, human curators are actually way better at that because I, I guess I've been painting a pretty grim picture about the power of the algorithm and how we're kind of the victim, but luckily the web is a place where humans congregate and it's a natural place for people to um, interact in online communities. So today we have masses, just masses and masses of online communities and we're getting more and more uh, people involved in them. Um, I think Reddit has something like 6% of all adult internet users in the US. So there's, there's a, real, um, a real huge amount of activity happening here. And here's a survey that was done last year of over 400 uh, quite well educated people in North America who were social media users. Now 78% of those people said that they participated in online communities so that they can help others by sharing information, ideas and experiences. So the authors of, of the study, they argue that this, what we're seeing is a real paradigm shift in information flow and influence. In other words, because people see these online communities as, as knowledgeable, they trust them and it's starting to displace our reliance on the traditional information channels. Well, all this brings me to to the main part of my talk, which is well, what do we actually know about online communities? This is how we've been looking at them so far. Most of the knowledge that we have about online communities is based around studies of what's visible. So really, because only about 1% or 9% of people are visible, we only have information based on that data, the online data. And the other that's the 10%, the other 90% get called lurkers. Now this pattern, this, this distribution of, inter, of participation turns out to apply across lots of different platforms and um, I think what it really highlights is the need to better understand this invisible majority of people. 
the research on lurkers is actually often underpinned by the idea that they should be moved along a continuum and um, encouraged or converted to become posters. And, and that's, that's great, but studies also show that lurking is a contextual behaviour. And what that means is that if you look at a different platform and another platform, the same person, the same individual might be in the 1% or the 9% or the 90%. So this is, this is actually an issue because the early studies tend to look at a single platform, but today online communities are changing and more and more different communication channels and tools are becoming available. And more and more people are using multiple tools to interact. So in order for us to understand um, information behaviours in online communities, we really need to get below the surface and get a much bigger picture of what's going on and one that looks beyond the boundaries of a single platform. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some research that I've done in this area and, and what I found out. Okay, so the, the setting for my research was um, a government funded uh, professional development program for New Zealand schools and um, it, went, it went for three years and the aim was to build uh, capability and using ICT for teaching and learning. And one, one quite interesting thing about New Zealand is that we have, have a number of schools, a lot of schools with a fairly small number of teachers and what that means is that it's a real issue. Um, we really need to try to transfer knowledge between schools as much as possible. So one of the program's key goals was to actually build professional learning communities and, and as part of that um, there was an emphasis on getting online communities to be active. So what my research aimed to understand was, was how is this happening, how are online communities helping to, to transfer knowledge and, and encourage change. Um, so I looked at three clusters of schools where there was a lot of activity in online communities or had been reported and I interviewed something like 45 people and also um, looked at online data. So before I tell you about what I found, just a little bit about well, what kind of knowledge am I talking about here because knowledge actually could be almost anything. So what I did is I, um, I talked to people, I looked at official documents to work out what professional knowledge professional knowledge really mattered in this setting and um, well it turned out that it was not just about training people how to use technology and computers. There were three real key themes um, that came out and as you can see it really was about a whole new way of teaching. The key one was becoming a facilitator of learning so the teacher had to slightly reposition their role or in some cases more radically reposition their role rather than being a, a leader or an instructor to being a facilitator and they had to understand why and how to do that. The second theme was about using IT to support student-led learning again why and how. And thirdly it was about developing uh, learning skills, so rather than filling people with knowledge, developing reusable learning skills. So for, for quite a few of the teachers that was a, a significant shift because it wasn't about adding on new knowledge, it was actually fundamentally about a change in how they, how they thought about their role and what they did. And the challenge actually is that this kind of transformation in professional knowledge is, is quite a difficult thing and the reason is, it's a bit like this, this picture, that, that people's knowledge is, is entirely bound up with their work routines, their practices, their frameworks and their belief structures and it's, it's enormously personalised and based in activities. So what that means is it's, it's not possible to change practices easily uh, unless you also look at changing and modifying your understandings and beliefs. So moving on to look at what I found and um, to start with I was just actually blinded by this, this surface view that I um, have just talked about earlier, the, the information blindness. When I talked to people about what online communities they belonged to, I got the same answer over and over again. People would tell me that they would belong to an official community that was based around 
discussion forums. And um, this was pretty much what the term online community meant to these people. So what I saw was three separate communities, but not there was quite a bit of activity within them happening in bursts, and there were people who were saying, like this quote below, that they were not a very active member. But that was actually was just a surface view, and when I started asking people questions in a different way, how, how do you communicate with other, other educators, I actually realised the picture was getting a lot more complex. So if you read this, I'll just let you read this for a moment. So this is what uh, Tina, who described herself as a lurker, said about the impact that bloggers had on her. It actually soon became quite clear that people in the community, not all of them, but a number of them were active either blogging or reading blogs. And, and you can see here that the passion of the bloggers was having an impact on Tina. But well, she wasn't a blogger, so doesn't that just make her a lurker? And in fact, no, it doesn't, because this is what she went on to say next. She said, I will Skype Sue, Sue's an active blogger, and I'll say that was a really good idea. I might talk to her about it, and I often might try that out in my room. I'm picking up ideas, and if they work, I share them with other people. So there's, some, there's two really interesting points here. First of all, Tina actually does turn out to be really active online. It's just that she's using Skype, which is, is a lot more informal and a private means of communicating than a blog. And secondly, that the ideas that Tina's getting from Sue via her blog and, and via Skype, they don't stop with Tina. She's actually passing on those ideas to other people. And she's checking, first of all, if they work. So it became quite clear to me that I needed to actually see the online community in a different way. I needed a, a larger view because if I wanted to actually understand how knowledge was being transferred in this setting, it just wasn't useful to equate the community with a single online platform. Now, if you think about it, Focusing on a single platform is a bit, it's a bit like studying a family in a house by looking only at the kitchen. So we can do that, and, but we wouldn't see the whole picture. The reality is that people do different things in different rooms, and we use different rooms to meet different needs. And it's the same with online communities. But it actually doesn't make sense to just limit the view to what's happening online. And the reason is online activities can lead to quite dramatic shifts in what happens in the workplace or in other offline settings. And um, one teacher actually told me about how through being in a forum, she found out that the teacher in the actual next room to her was passionate about the same kind of teaching ideas as her, and she had no idea. So she could go into the staff room and open up a new discussion with that teacher. Um, and another example, a teacher was talking about actually being at a, at a presentation and he said that by looking at the Twitters that were going on at the same time, it helped him to understand that presentation to a higher level. So in these examples, the value of the new knowledge that we're talking about here, it didn't come from any one of these bubbles or these engagement spaces. It actually came as a result of crossing between them. And uh, here's actually what one teacher said about all of this crossing over activity. So this is a fairly long, this is a fairly profound statement in fact. I'll just give you a moment to look at that. So if someone's asked quite an interesting question, I just popped over and looked at the, uh, at the conversation. Um, it's interesting because the, the culture in, in uh, the staff room was in fact that people did not previously talk about teaching practice in the, in the staff room. And uh, if you think about traditional teaching, people are pretty isolated in their room, they're alone with their students. So it's actually remarkable um, the difference that having online setting can make. Okay, so because Tina, um, oh sorry, it's not Tina, it's another teacher, 
this teacher needed to redefine her thinking as she moved between spaces. And what actually happened is it helped her to gain better clarity about what she thought and believed. So you might ask, well, what's actually different from before? Didn't, didn't this actually happen before? Didn't people move between different spaces? And yes, that's true. But in this, in this setting, there was such a dramatic increase in the number of engagement spaces in this community that it actually had quite a profound impact. And, and it was in three different, different ways. First of all, there was a, an increased rate of professional dialogue. And that extended outside of working hours into the evenings. And secondly, it, there were a lot more spaces that were ones that required reflection. These spaces all had different, different cultures of youth that were linked with them. And uh, thirdly, it created norms and expectations. So it, it became expected that people would talk about teaching and pedagogy and what they did. And so the key message is that once we stop looking at these individual spaces or platforms and we shift our focus to the bigger picture of the, the activity and the crossing between these spaces, we actually start to see the community more clearly. And the key roles and relationships also become much more easy to see. So now I'll talk about that in a minute, but first of all, we'll just have a look at the overall structure of this, these communities that were in this study. So this is how it first look, firstly looked to me when I first looked. This is the surface view. Um, but if we rearrange things a bit, just to take into account of what was happening outside of the official communities and, there's, and, the, and, and in the blogging community, we can actually see that there's a global blogging network that's sort of connecting up these different communities. And this is, the, this is the big picture. So now we can see the whole, how the three communities actually were connected. They weren't directly connected, but they were connected indirectly through a small group of people who we can see in the blue in the middle. And this is, this is a group of, of knowledge brokers who were also connected quite closely with the blogging community. So now let's look a bit more closely at this, this group of brokers. So it took me a while to see the two different types. Um, I've called them connector leaders and follower feeders, and I'll explain this in a minute. But the connector leaders were very visible online. They were very actually easy to see, and people talked about them a lot in the interviews. The invisible ones, the follower feeders, were actually very invisible, um, which, is, which is where I will be talking in a second. So, well, the key thing about both these roles is that they were non-official roles. They were emergent roles that had occurred over a two to three year period. And these people basically operated in, in different habitats. And they had different customers. But they were mutually dependent. So let's have a look at the connector leaders. So here they are in red. These people were really core members of that blogging community. And they followed and corresponded with what I call alpha bloggers, people who were quite um, not prominent. They authored their own blogs. And in that sense, they were local thought leaders and advisors. They made themselves really available to get um, support through after hours, instant messaging, Twitter, other, other channels, email. Um, and the interesting thing is that they were outward facing and that they primarily identified as members of the blogging community. So if they had a problem, they, they said to me, well, we really need to go to that community to get help. OK, so they were, they were kind of leaders. And they fed knowledge to the non-blogging followers. And this is quite interesting because they did it, even though they used very sophisticated means like RSS feeds themselves, they knew that a lot of their followers did not. And so they would send things manually using email and using IM. And this is a hero moment for those of you who are librarians. This comment was made by a teacher who was not a librarian. And she said, it's like some nice librarian comes up and says, there's 15 books you might well be interested in. These guys have filtered out a whole lot of good stuff so I can focus on reading and thinking about it. So you, you will be quite familiar with this activity. Let's just look a little bit more closely at what these people were doing. So here's the, the key activities that I found that the connector leaders were engaging in. Um, and I'm calling them connector leaders because they connected people as well as being thought leaders. They were quite actively made introductions. 
So looking down on the left, I actually would be interested at this stage to see if this is familiar to any of you. How many of you do these things on the left? I don't know, Steve, whether you can get people to You do some things on the left. You can click on the green check yes or tick, the green tick. It's under the uh, fourth icon over in the participant window. It's a yes, no selection. So that'll be an easy way to toggle. There are nine so far who've said yes, they do them. Yes, yes, yes. OK, we've got a lot of yeses and 13 yeses. <laughs> That's great. So um, yeah, with this audience, I imagine a lot of you are, are doing this kind of thing. So you can be familiar with this role. And uh, in this change setting that we're talking about, this was the result on the right-hand side. So it was actually helping people to focus their attention on what mattered in this setting. Um, it persuaded them. They, they were really persuasive, these people. Persuaded them of the value of changing. It helped to align people across the community. Um, helped individuals to adapt to different ways of doing things. And, and actually, an interesting one is it also encouraged people to own the ideas for themselves. So there was some very interesting discussion about what was and wasn't plagiarism, but people needed to own ideas that they got elsewhere by themselves. So this is a sophisticated example of human curation. And, and yes, it is filtering. But it's quite different from the blindness by algorithm because it's actually meeting the genuine community needs in this setting. So now let's look at the invisible brokers. These people followed the connector leaders. They didn't follow all of them. They tended to follow one or two of them quite closely. And those connector leaders knew who followed them. They communicated with the, the leaders invisibly. When I say invisibly, by our instant messaging, by our IM. Um, and they very actively avoided having a visible online presence. They just did not want to be seen online. Um, but in the workplace, they were real leaders but in practice. And so I say they were inward facing. They had a lot of respect um, in that setting internally. They fed the ideas that they got, they fed on the ideas from the blogging community, and they fed those on to their followers, but they made decisions about what to pass on. They were very much uh, making, making choices and filtering. Um, so really, if we look at what they're doing, they're actually being brokers across the online, offline boundary. And we can see, actually we can't see what they're doing online, and that's the challenge. How do we see what they're doing offline? It's, it's actually invisible. That's the interesting thing. Here are some examples of what these people said about themselves. Just, I'm going to give you a little bit of a moment to look at this. <laughs> some people are recognizing this too. OK. This is, this is amazing, really. Um, these people were really quite self-deprecating when they talked about themselves. Um, they, they really were playing a critical role, and yet they didn't see much value in what they were doing. Um, you can see that they were very reluctant to, to pass on or to make a comment in public, um, although, interestingly enough, they will put a comment on a closed forum. And, um, but they had a tremendous sense of duty towards their workmates. And in that sense, one of them said they have to go out seeking, they've got to go out seeking more information to give to them. And um, actually, you probably recognize that food chain language. I was fascinated that people really were using words like parasite and feeding quite a lot when I talked to them. Um, that was an interesting thing. And so here's a really interesting example of these people at work. So. Let's have a look at this. On the left-hand side, we can see a, a forum. This is a forum in the official community. And the forum people are talking about web quests and how great web quests might be to use with students. And Susan agrees with it in theory, but then she says that re web quests are actually impractical. So she kind of disagrees. Now, Eric, who's um, a, a lead, actually a lead teacher at another school, but but not a, not a blogger. He challenged her view, but she, he did it in instant messaging. He did it in a private space. And he offered an alternative. He basically said, you're being a bit of a purist. Here's a way to modify and adapt what you're doing. 
So she started testing things out in her classroom based on Eric's suggestions. And then he came back and they talked a little bit more over instant messaging. They're in different schools. And um, really interestingly, um, he eventually came in using instant messaging into her classroom and interrupted and said, hey, I hope you're working on the web quests. So he's actually reinforcing quite strongly that change. And what is really interesting is if we frame this from the perspective of lurking, we see things really differently. So what we see in the forum is Susan being a slightly negative, fairly inactive participant, and we don't see Eric at all. And yet, far from being a lurker, he's actually showing a really sophisticated awareness of context by shifting that conversation out of the forum and into a private online space where he can hold a really frank discussion in a way that Susan does not lose face. So I think this shows that if we only, if we can focus on this, this crossing, this boundary crossing activity and look beyond the obvious online data source of the forum, that we can actually start to see what's really happening. So I hope, um, yeah, I think I've been I've been painting a picture that might suggest to you that all of the value is kind of coming from the top, from the bloggers and drifting down to the teachers who are in, in the classroom. But that actually wasn't the case. Um, and when I interviewed people, I actually found out that those ones in the classroom were keeping in touch with the more active connector leaders. And the connector leaders would often take and adapt and modify something that, that was being done, perhaps a more traditional successful practice in the classroom, um, and and then develop something that was successful on their on their online um, blog or another online setting that they were using. So actually the connector leaders tended to feed ideas about why, why make change and persuading people why they needed to change downwards. But the more kind of practical um, ideas, the how solutions came, uh, came upwards as well. And they came, I guess, using these invisible side channels. They came, and, and sometimes from face-to-face -face conversations. But the ideas did come out of the classroom. Um, to to be used and adapted by the online community. So I hope that you would agree with me that these invisible brokers provided absolutely tremendous value. So um, I'm just going to raise a real issue here because the really scary part of this whole thing was the invisibility of it. And um, it turned out that not a single principal that out of all the people I interviewed, not a single principal could see the value of what was happening in this, in this situation. Um, the people who were the followers could not really see the value that they were providing. And so they didn't see the value and they didn't even notice what the people were doing. And I guess that's not entirely surprising because they were actually even more invisible than the gorilla. But it does pose a real issue when you've got something enormously valuable going on. So what should we do about this? So this almost um, brings me to the end of my talk before I open up for questions. So what, what kind of lessons can we take away from this, this study? Um, I think the key thing um, is that we do need to look beneath the surface. So we've got to recognise that, that communities today are really multimodal and they're online as well as offline. There's not a lot of point just looking in one place or one dimension. And a lot of the value and the activity happens between the spaces and not just within them. And of course this does raise a real problem. It's, it's like, well, how do we see this? How do we study this? Uh, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's a very important challenge. So, and this is, I think, where you can also play a part, those of you who are listening today. I think we all need to watch out for the invisible gorilla. We need to look out for people who are adding value. And we need to look out for brokers who are playing key roles who may be invisible. Maybe talk to them, maybe ask people who's making a difference. And, and recognise 
inter interdependencies between people as well as individuals. Even amongst the connector leaders, they were different. And I had one one pair of bloggers who talked about each other and how they were like yin and yang and how one was more focused on theory and one was more focused on practice. But how together, I guess that, that ecosystem analogy works really well. The symbiosis of it, the interdependency was really important. So I'm hoping that, that you um, are in a position to start to see the value um, of settings that you are working in. Um, and find ways to help others see the value. Because if, if key stakeholders can't see the value, then that's enormously risky. So, and finally, I think that we need to work hard to please don't be the invisible gorilla. So we're all different. Some of us are confident at having a voice in the online ecosystem. Um, others are more comfortable behind the scenes, but I think it's important that we think about our, where we belong in the eco ecosystem. We find our place and we find our voice. So that's where I would like to um, throw this open really and, and see does, does this look familiar to any of you? And uh, what questions does this raise for people who are working in library and information professions? So if you have a question or would like to make a comment, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand and we'll give you the microphone. I did capture a couple of thoughts in the moderator tab for you. One was from Peggy George who wondered, uh, is the forum the catalyst for those private conversations that bring around clarification and action, bring about clarification and action? Yeah, that, that's a good question. What actually happened was that initially the forum was used to help bring people on board and get some common ways of thinking going and it played an important part at the very start when people were kind of coming onto the same page and actually the, you know, for example, Mark Prensky and the, um, the digital native, digital immigrant metaphor actually became really prominent um, in, in some workplaces during that online forum discussion. But what, what happened, you know, within, within the, maybe a year is that natural leaders started to emerge and in, in New Zealand teaching is a very personal individual thing and individual teachers do things differently and that's encouraged. So what happened is that as people moved on and got more confident they wanted to explore things, different things and they actually talked about how they went out looking for different people who knew more and it tended to be more outside of the formal community. They would then at that point go looking for knowledgeable people who had perhaps a more specialist interest and, and try to find others working in the particular space. Sorry, Jocelyn, there was a question by Audrey <coughs> who says, what about when you are the invisible gorilla at your own school but not elsewhere? That's a good question, Audrey, because actually I met someone who, who was in that exact situation. Um, it was it was dreadful. It was a, a really influential uh, person who was um, getting a voice uh, online. So I guess they they were just they were actually part of a national blogging community and quite respected in that setting. But within this school, there was some resistance. And um, I recall vividly uh, reading uh, a message that person posted, a really depressed message about how he had gone into the staff room with, and done a presentation about all these great ideas and it had just, just fallen flat. Um, and that's, I guess, partly what I mean by outward facing. There, there actually were some people internally following that person, but in, in one case, that, and I only saw it once, there was, um, there was a kind of a mismatch uh, it was this particular teacher, by the way, wasn't in one of the three, um, the three main communities because I, I went out and I looked for uh, three or four more people in the blogging community towards the end of my study. But it, it's a it's a problem. It's a real problem. Yeah. 
So earlier in your presentation when you were talking about uh, sort of how people would uh, talk to each other and different thoughts would come out, I posted my favorite Irish quote of how will I know what I'm thinking until I hear myself say it. And Annika disagrees. She says, how do I know what to say until I've given it serious thought? Any response? Okay. To there, yeah, yeah. Um, really good point. So what what people did is they did a lot of rehearsal and there were some rehearsal spaces as well. So um, I would find that people would sometimes um, post an idea in a semi-protected space or using email. These are the ones who were not confident, okay, these are more like the followers who wanted to post in a forum. But actually they would take their idea into the staff room and they might talk to somebody about it. Or they would use instant messaging in Skype to share an emerging blog post. So um, they, they were, and in, the, in, the, in that setting they were being challenged to justify, you know, why are you doing this and how are you doing this. Um, but, but the process of, of all of that work, and I guess it's a bit like drafting and redrafting except that different, different spaces work differently, that did seem to help people to understand what they thought. Um, but it was different with the confident bloggers. They, they would just go out there and, and post what they thought. So Peggy wants to know where your research is published. Okay, it's published, uh, Peggy. I'm going to have to recommend uh, an algorithm <laughs> to help you. Um, but I, I can, I'm happy to send you links. But um, either you could look at my my page um, at Victoria University on my um, on the on my staff page, or you could use Google Scholar uh, or just a Google search. And um, unfortunately, it might initially show up the name Jocelyn Wildenstein, which is <laughs> Unfortunate, but but um, you you should find me there because I don't think there's another Jocelyn Cranfield who's okay. There it is. Yep, Peggy's found the link. Thank you. So Jocelyn, I'm curious. Do you see any connection between the actual act of sort of conformist schooling and the concern about speaking up or being confident in your own beliefs or thought processes? Yes, I think that um, it's a very good question. Um, if the school wasn't coming wholeheartedly on board with something, it was it was really hard for people to speak out in their workplace about what they thought. But there were early, if you like, early adopters, early thought leaders, and um, that 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 blogging community, and I, I call it that, even though. So we're using lots of different channels. That that was really a supportive environment for them to start to develop, uh, if what you might say, a dissenting voice. Um, but when the schools involved in this particular program were um, were committing to change just by just through virtue of being in the program. But having said that, I did find that in one or two cases, um, a principal might be quite close to retirement, and they they just didn't really want to deal with rocking the boat. Um, with resistance to change, and in that case, the the people who were the thought leaders internally would 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 have a much more difficult time. I wonder if there's an even deeper connection. If we sort of expect students to learn the same material at the same time over the course of their studying, um, there is sort of a negative uh, pressure against being different or thinking differently. Is that, do you think that plays into the whole model as well? Yeah, I, I think that it would. And um, this is where I'm I'm in a slightly different setting because in New Zealand um, there is quite a long history of, of of believing you know teachers are independent professionals. So you know we we haven't really had that teach to the book whole class teaching thing here. Um, but I would think that yes, it's a significant a significant issue and problem. Um, it's you know when I used to work in, in educational publishing, we we there was a demand in schools uh, for if you like written scripts for teachers to help them. Um, there there was I think a little bit more difficulty in in finding the voice. And I I've also read research done in Malaysia and a similar thing. It was very very difficult if people have got a different way. 
uh, a sort of a top-down way of teaching, a whole class way of teaching, yeah, yeah, it's going to be really hard to um, to get that change happening. So we're we're in question and answer mode. If you have a question for uh, Jocelyn, you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand, and we'll give you the microphone. I'm going to clap for you again, just because it's so hard to find that darn applause button. I'm going to tell people if you <laughs> under the smiley face. Hover over the smiley face, then go down to applause. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I hear the applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So Jan wants to know, she says, I'm curious about the time frame. That is, the evolution of the communities and interactions. OK, this is, this is a good question. I th actually, I think this is a yarn, this one. Um, this is... Um, this is interesting because yeah, it took quite a while to get this this level of quite sophisticated activity. It, it evolved. It wasn't no one trained people how to use these different spaces, but um, it really took about two years before this kind of very highly functional um, multimodal community with people. I haven't um, given you a lot of detail about this, but all these different spaces were used in particular ways by the community and everyone understood how what to do where. Um, so yeah, two to three years, so it's not an overnight thing. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. It's and interesting oh, great. Yeah. So I'm interested in the degree to which certain tools, technologies really reshape culture, and then yeah. we reconstruct our activities based on those cultural changes. So it feels to me like there's a little bit of a, uh, a direct line from the technology to culture change and from the culture change to what we think education should do. Is this mm -hmm. a pretty significant moment in terms of technology? Yeah, yeah. Um, I spoke to the program director of the program and basically just this, this sort of explosion of technology I think made a huge difference and she said we're, we're trying to manage on shifting sands because the technology was exploding and, and yeah, with that came technologies that actually had an established culture of use and so if we if we look at say Twitter, that was actually a safe place for people to be like non-professional if they wanted to and like tell slightly self-deprecating jokes or they could Skype about what they were doing and um, you know, you can't do that on a blog. On a blog, you've got to be profoundly professional and you've got to actually say something that's your original idea, maybe combine the ideas of other people, but you've actually got to justify what you're saying. So, yeah, yeah I really think this made a difference. The culture that came with the technologies helped um, shift shift things and, and free them up and get, get, get conversations happening and, and make people relax a little bit more and, and find ways of being supported. You know, I actually have direct history here because when we started Classroom 2.0, we yeah. noticed a really significant shift from blogging, which often had an acerbic kind of uh, all caps mm -hmm. anger to it sometimes. Wow, wow. And in yeah. the Classroom 2.0 environment, there was much more of an opportunity for short responses, not the same pressure to be seen. It uh, felt like it was a kinder, gentler place. And I think yeah, in part we yeah. tried to make it a kinder, gentler place, but I think the technology itself allowed for less posturing. And, and I felt like there was a pretty significant shift there. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, I think we call that affordances of technology. I mean, it, it's it's very, very interesting area. And um, that, that I guess that's a huge opportunity for, for more research um, because it's, you know, there's no point just like looking in the forums, it's, it's what's happening in the, in the combination of all of these, these things. So I guess what's going to happen in the future is another question. What, what about future technologies? What about Google Glass? You know, what, what's going to happen? How is it going to change culture? I don't know the answer to that. So for those of you who, who have enjoyed this keynote, and I certainly have, 
uh, David Weinberger's earlier keynote today would be worth watching. And he, he looks at Reddit and the lessons from Reddit and the ways in which the, the cultures have both been a result of the technology, but also have been constructed within the technology. Um, Jocelyn, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for coming along today, tonight, for Sunday here, Saturday in America. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're now officially closing the conference. There is an after party. We keep it really short. The link is on the uh, schedule page. Feel free to come in and just say hello and thank you, and then we're all going to go to bed, especially here in the U.S. And I'm sorry, there is no code for Connected Educator Month. They did not give us a code for this session, so you're not going to get a badge. I apologize. Thanks to Dr. Cranefield. Thanks to everybody involved in the conference. Have a great night or day. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>